Hi, and welcome to the first session of this Assessment of Alternatives training series. As Molly Jacobs mentioned in her introduction, my name is Pam Eliason. I'm a Senior Associate Director at the Toxics Use Reduction Institute, which is located in the state of Massachusetts in the United States. And I am one of our lead trainers for this training on the Assessment of Alternatives. Welcome. During Molly's introduction to this training series, she provided a really great high-level overview on the importance of informed substitution. Making an informed decision can help your company reduce risks and costs associated with regulation and liabilities, can help you create opportunities for innovation and efficiencies, can help facilitate continuous improvement in your facility and simply doing what's right for your workers, for public health, and for the environment. The assessment of alternatives is key to informed substitution. As a reminder, we'll be using the terms of alternatives, alternatives assessment, analysis of alternatives, and alternatives analysis to mean the same general approach that guides informed substitution decisions. This session dives into the first stage of the assessment of alternatives, determining the scope of your effort. After completing this session, you should be able to understand the importance of stakeholder engagement, identify key elements when scoping the assessment, understand how chemical function and functional use can guide the scoping process, and understand what methods and decision rules need to be made explicit in the assessment. This session outlines the critical first steps of an assessment of alternatives, which is developing the scope of the assessment. As a reminder, each session in this training series is designed to build on, to build on the other. And in practice, however, you may choose to conduct these elements in a different order. This schematic is a simple reminder of where we're headed in this training and how this session fits into the rest of the training series. It also illustrates a key philosophy that the assessment of alternatives is not intended to be a linear process, but rather one that can be revisited and revised as new information and new strategies emerge. There are a number of reasons why you might find yourself looking for a substitute. It could be that regulations are driving you to substitute a specific chemical of concern that you currently use in your operations or product manufacturing. Perhaps your customers or other market demands are pushing you to get out of the business of using a specific chemical of concern because of human health or environmental concerns. Maybe you and your colleagues have conducted an inventory of chemicals used in your operations and have prioritized those that you want to substitute to get either to get ahead of regulations or to improve the health and safety of your workplace or maybe simply to innovate. Or maybe it's all of those things. Whatever the reason, you need a plan. This session outlines the steps that should be part of your planning process. Displayed here is a schematic from one of the assessment of alternatives frameworks that Molly mentioned in her introduction, a framework established by the US National Academies of Science. As we see, after you have identified the chemical of concern, that you would like to substitute, the first critical step is to establish the scope of the assessment. No matter what alternatives assessment framework you follow, clearly defining your scope is a good practice. The subsequent components of the assessment pro process, including hazard and exposure, technical and cost feasibility assessments, will benefit from the time you spend up front to better define the scope. Used effectively, this step will focus and narrow elements of the assessment to help you use your resources more effectively. There are four key steps associated with defining the scope and formulating the problem that you want to solve. First is to determine the appropriate level of stakeholder engagement that you need to best inform the various pieces of the assessment. Second is to identify the goals principles and decision rules that will guide the assessment process. It's important to establish these up front so that there is both consistency and transparency throughout your process. 
The third step is to more fully characterize the chemical of concern that you're seeking to substitute. And finally, the fourth step is about determining the methods you'll use in the assessment, including what endpoints you want to address and how you'll handle data gaps and uncertainties. Here, you'll be thinking about how you and other decision makers define what it means for an alternative to be safer and feasible. This, in turn, will affect how robust and reliable or reproducible your results will be, how you will manage the inevitable data gaps, what sources of information you will rely upon, etc. This session covers each of these four elements in more detail. It is important to consider that there are stakeholders, those who may be impacted by and or have knowledge about which alternatives should be considered and ultimately adopted. So who is a stakeholder? It's important to consider individuals both inside and outside of your organization as stakeholders. This can include a range of staff internal to your organization who have varied relevant experience and expertise, as well as suppliers, customers, or other downstream users. This can also include researchers or others who have technical expertise that may be missing in your, in your assessment team. Assessments of alternatives are by their very nature multidisciplinary. The assessment requires expertise in chemistry, engineering, toxicology, exposure assessment, and cost analysis, among other things. You may have expertise in all of these disciplines within your own company. And even then, identifying expert advisors who are able to provide additional critical information and advice to inform the assessment process might also be helpful. Where expertise and perspectives are missing, such as making sure there is a full understanding of the options, hazards, trade-offs, and barriers to adoption of an alternative, including other stakeholders, can help fill these important gaps. Stakeholder engagement can be cumbersome and resource-intensive, yet experience demonstrates that it is worth the effort. While it is critical to include stakeholders at the beginning of the assessment to help you in defining its scope and goals, engaging stakeholders at all stages of the assessment, from identifying candidate alternatives to evaluation and adoption stages, can also be incredibly useful. The US-based Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse, or IC2, has an alternatives assessment guide, which identifies three levels of stakeholder engagement that you may want to consider. First is at the corporate or organizational level. Here you identify the impacted people, their expertise, their concerns, and how their concerns might be best addressed in the alternatives assessment. The second is a process that identifies potential external stakeholders and actively seeks their input in a formal and structured process for specific steps in your assessment process, such as in defining the performance criteria that might be considered. The third is a process in which stakeholders are invited to participate in all aspects of the alternatives assessment from scoping to adoption of an alternative. Stakeholders could also serve on the assessment team and review the final assessment product. So which level of engagement is important for your substitution process? It might vary depending on the problem you're needing to tackle. As I mentioned, there are a number of reasons why you want to include different stakeholders at various stages of your assessment. Trade-offs associated with making changes need to be understood. When you have a range of stakeholders helping you, for instance, in your scoping process, you will have a better understanding of the range of impacts both the chemical concern and its possible substitutes may present. For instance, when my organization was trying to prioritize use of five chemicals in our 2006 study, we began by bringing in a variety of stakeholders, including manufacturers and suppliers, but also local environmental and labor organizations, as well as academics. I'll never forget hearing about labor concerns associated with construction worker exposures to hexavalent chromium in demolition debris. This led us to thinking about the use of hex chrome in building products. 
We also, of course, heard about the reluctance of customers to lose a specific color given by hex chrome in their decorative plating process. Learning about the various concerns and the priorities of a wide range of stakeholders helped us to focus on the priority uses of the chemicals of concern so that our alternatives assessment project was as efficient and meaningful for our community as possible. Having more than one source of information when considering the possibility of making substitution or other process changes in your manufacturing process is always wise. Line workers may have thought of alternatives that were not identified by your chemists or your process engineers. Suppliers may have information on alternatives for different uses with similar functional requirements that a manufacturer might not have considered. Academic researchers may have access to data on chemical hazards and environmental impacts or on performance metrics or data sources that you were just not able to find. It's really important to get buy-in from across your organization when proposing a change to process or product. How likely is it that a substitution will succeed if your customer or other downstream users rejects it? Substitution will require, will likely require some changes in process changes or work process conditions or work habits. So making sure that affected stakeholders understand and support these changes gives them the opportunity to develop appropriate training and work practices needed to support its effective adoption. Finally, some laws require stakeholder engagement in the assessment process. The state of California's Safer Consumer Products Regulatory Alternatives Analysis Process requires stakeholder consultation. Some third-party product certification processes, such as Green Seal, also have requirements for stakeholder engagement in identifying and defining the criteria for safer products and in their specific review. I want you to take about five minutes now to learn a bit about Sherwin-Williams's experience working with stakeholders in their efforts to replace BPA in metal can linings. We've added a short chemical wash article that is available for free in their 2018 fourth edition of their business guide to safer chemicals in this section of the training materials. Next, I'd like you to listen to a short clip from an alternatives assessment practitioner, Amelia Nessler, which you can find in this section of the training. Amelia is a senior environmental scientist for Northwest Green Chemistry, located in the state of Washington in the United States. She was recently part of the team involved in evaluating alternatives for anti-fouling coatings for recreational boats. This assessment was requested by regulatory officials in the state of Washington because of threats to their salmon fisheries, which are important to the economy of the state. Amelia will elaborate on the question of why engaging stakeholders was vital to the success of their project. Hello, my name is Amelia Nessler. I'm a senior environmental scientist at Northwest Green Chemistry, and I was the project lead for the Washington State Anti-Fouling Boat Paint Alternatives Assessment. Anti-fouling boat paint is the paint you put on the bottom of a boat to keep barnacles and algae and stuff like that from growing on it. Fouling like this causes the boat to move slower and be less maneuverable while consuming more fuel. It can also mean it transports invasive species and can even damage the boat itself. The most popular method used today, copper, is toxic to salmon, particularly when used in fresh water. Our alternatives assessment identified potentially preferable alternatives and then assessed them for hazard, exposure, cost and availability, and performance. Engaging stakeholders was vital to the success of this project. We actively sought out diverse stakeholders representing everyone involved, including retailers, manufacturers, applicators, cleaners and maintenance workers, users, governments, and representatives for the environment. We actively sought them out, and we're, we were constantly asking, who else should be here? Then we would go and reach out to those people. We provided a variety of mechanisms for feedback, going to where stakeholders were in person, at boat shows, festivals, trade shows, 
but also providing virtual opportunities like conference calls and email. Importantly, we had champions from inside the community who were invested in seeing this product succeed. We made sure that there were many opportunities for them to speak with the community as well. By engaging stakeholders, we improved our results in every module and overall. It improved our scoping, especially if you're going to have to narrow down your list of alternatives. What products do boaters and boatyards actually care about? What products are manufacturers discontinuing? What products do manufacturers really believe in and want to see included? Also, by engaging a diverse group, we ended up finding more outside the box ideas. We could have looked at biocides only and just evaluated alternative biocides. We could have looked at coatings only and just evaluated coatings. We went beyond and included sound-based devices and alternative cleaning methods. This also improved our access to expertise and data. These people are experts in their field. We had an opportunity to visit a boatyard, learn about their operations and their struggles. We spoke with boaters about how they actually use their boats and what they see as priorities. It also gave us a deeper understanding of their challenges. What do boaters actually have to cope with? What is good enough performance? We learned that waterborne coatings have a problem in Puget Sound. It's so humid, they take a very long time to dry. There are some paints that have been reported to work very well on the East Coast, but the stakeholders I spoke with in Puget Sound had difficulties with application. It was peeling off in sheets. So there are often local issues at play that you can learn about by engaging stakeholders. By engaging stakeholders, we improved our results and we increased adoption by directly addressing these stakeholder concerns. Take a moment to think on the differences you may have noticed between the stakeholder engagement process described by Amelia and that of Sherwin-Williams, formerly Valspar, as described in the ChemWatch article. When you are planning your alternatives assessment process, think about the chemicals used in your operations and which stakeholders you may want to hear from to help you in prioritizing your focus and making your process efficient. The second step in determining the scope of your assessment is to define your goals, articulate any guiding principles of your efforts, and clarify your decision rules. Your goals should reflect what you're, why you're doing the assessment in the first place. What is driving you or your organization? Clarifying this will impact many of your subsequent choices. So why are you embarking on this process? Is it because of regulatory compliance or customer demands? Is it to help your company pursue sustainable product marketing opportunities or to improve the health and safety of the workplace? Is it an innovation strategy that might unlock new markets for you? Understanding the goals of your organization will help you shape the assessment process and the decisions you make, decisions that come at every turn in the process. If you are responding to a regulatory compliance driver, for instance, you may find yourself being a little more risk averse in your choices. And by this, I mean in a business context rather than a hazard exposure context. If, however, you're striving to innovate or to be a market leader, you may be more willing to take chances that if successful, could lead to major gains in your business. Principles should operationalize your goals to help guide the assessment and associated decisions. Ultimately, the principles that guide your process will be dictated by your organization's values, obligations, and priorities. One example of principles that may be of value to any assessment are the Commons Principles for Alternatives Assessment. These were developed by NGOs in the U.S. and agreed to by over 130 signatories, including some global industry leaders. There are six principles in this set. First, reduce hazard. Reduce hazard by replacing a chemical of concern with a less hazardous alternative. Consider reformulation to avoid use of the chemical of concern altogether. Second, minimize exposure. Assess use patterns and exposure pathways to limit exposure to alternatives that may present risks. Third, use best available information. Obtain access to and use information that assists in distinguishing between possible choices. Before selecting preferred options, 
characterize the product and process sufficiently to avoid choosing alternatives that may result in unintended adverse consequences. Fourth, require disclosure and transparency. Require disclosure across the supply chain regarding key chemical and technical information. Engage stakeholders throughout the assessment process to promote transparency in regard to alternatives assessment methodologies employed, data used to characterize alternatives, assumptions made, and decision-making rules applied. Fifth, resolve trade-offs. Use information about the product's life cycle to better understand potential benefits, impacts, and mitigation options associated with different alternatives. When substitution options do not provide a clear, preferable solution, consider organizational goals and values to determine appropriate weighting of decision criteria and identify acceptable trade-offs. And finally, take action. Choose safer alternatives that are commercially available, technically and economically feasible, and satisfy the performance requirements of the process or product. Collaborate with supply chain partners to drive innovation in the development and adoption of safer substitutes. Review new information to assure that the option selected remains a safer choice. I think you can see how these might be a really great set of principles to start with. I encourage you to download the principles from the training materials for this session. Decision rules are derived from the goals and the principles of the assessment and are implemented during the evaluation steps. When we think of decisions, we may think only about the rules we'll use to determine which alternative is preferred. But really, decisions have to be made throughout the assessment, from determining what data sources we use, to how we'll deal with gaps in the data or uncertainty about the data obtained. It's important to work with your stakeholders when establishing these decision rules, as this will help ensure transparency in the process and that everyone is on the same page about how the assessment will be or was carried out. Decision rules are particularly important to help screen out possible alternatives early in the process on the basis of performance, toxicity, or regulatory concern indicators, for instance. And as I mentioned, deciding how to manage data gaps or uncertainty is an essential element of being both consistent and transparent. Not surprisingly, we see that most decision rules are negative in nature. Avoid specific types of chemicals or materials or processes with certain inherent hazard characteristics. For example, for example persistent bioaccumulative and toxic or PBT chemicals or known carcinogens. These decision rules are important in order to be in compliance with various regulatory requirements and not just chemicals legislation, but perhaps worker health and safety or fire regulations and standards, among others. Avoid alternatives that might affect critical populations, such as children, pregnant women, key ecological indicator species, etc. Negatively weight alternatives where there are critical data gaps. Lack of information is often erroneously considered to be an indication that there is not a concern. However, it may simply be that the regulations or restrictions on a chemical have not caught up to the science, or that the chemical in question was commercialized relatively recently and therefore little data for human or environmental impact has been developed. Avoid options that do not meet essential performance criteria. This is pretty self-explanatory. If an option won't give you the performance or the outcome you require, it is unlikely to be adopted no matter how affordable or safe it might be. Negatively weight alternatives that are not widely available or are still in early stage of production. Newly developed chemicals or materials have likely not been thoroughly tested for specific uses and could therefore impact reliability of, of performance. But this last example rule is one that might stymie innovation. For some alternatives, time may be needed to scale innovations or to test their performance. 
but check your impulse to disregard some alternatives that may be in the earlier stages of innovation. If these are the alternatives that provide the most promise, there are ways to move forward in their implementation. We'll get to this issue in session five. A couple of slides ago, I mentioned the issue of transparency. Although the process of assessing alternatives is a technical one, the reality is that similar assessments for the same chemical of concern will likely come up with slightly different results since the principles, goals, values, perspectives, and expert judgment of the assessor are unlikely to match exactly. So for example, a corporate commitment not to use suspected carcinogens in the workplace can quickly rule out options that might be considered by another organization who relies more on exposure control to minimize potential impacts on their workers. Or different applications of a chemical of concern may face performance restrictions unique to that process, which may lead them to a potentially safer option being ruled out. Expect this and be transparent about it so that others can recognize why decisions about the feasibility of a given alternative were made. And it's particularly critical for you to be transparent about how you handle missing information or data in your evaluation, as this can have a big impact on the outcome of your process. Let's review important aspects of the first two elements of determining the scope of the assessment of alternatives. First, stakeholder engagement is critical. Engaging stakeholders will help focus the assessment, provide access to information, and improve acceptance of the results. But don't be fooled. It takes forethought and commitment to, vote, to devote the time and resources necessary to identify and engage with the right stakeholders at the right time. Second, don't underestimate the importance of establishing clear goals, principles, and decision rules for the assessment. This will improve transparency and focus the assessment, thus reducing the time and resources necessary for completion. Committing to these aspects of your scope can also be challenging, however, and as a practitioner, it is your role to help the organization see how the goals, principles, and decision rules you're proposing work with their overall business process. The purpose of this step is to understand key properties of the chemical of concern that will guide your thinking and the thinking of your stakeholders about possible alternatives. Characterizing the chemical of concern involves identifying its physical and chemical properties, potential exposure pathways that could lead to an impact on your workers or the environment, and the mechanisms that impact its function. This step forces you to focus your assessment on pertinent routes of exposure as well as on other important life cycle impacts that are meaningful given how the alternative will be used in order to replace the function served by the chemical of concern. Addressing these characteristics of the chemical helps to narrow the assessment to what is relevant. As we've mentioned several times, it's important to focus on function when characterizing the chemical of concern. But I realize that there can be different interpretations of what a function is versus what an application might be. For the purposes of this training, we think about function as the service, the action that a chemical broadly provides. The application is the use of a chemical in the specific circumstance under, under assessment. So consider a solvent. It is a chemical that causes typically solids to dissolve, thereby allowing them to be used for a specific application like in a cleaning formulation. We are stressing a focus on function because it enables assessors to explore how and why a chemical is used rather than simply trying to find a chemical to replace it with. Consider the example of bisphenol A in thermal paper receipts. 
the European Commission has issued a ban on BPA used in thermal receipt paper as of 2020, which has opened the door to finding substitutes. However, some proposed substitutes use chemicals like bisphenol S, which poses similar endocrine disrupting risks as does bisphenol A. This is not an example, therefore, of a substitution that minimizes the impacts associated with hazardous chemicals. So rather than tweak the molecule a bit, let's take a step back and look at the function BPA provides. BPA functions as a developer in thermal receipt paper. It reacts with white or colorless dyes in the presence of heat, converting them to a dark color that shows up as the image or text on the paper. This function is important to understand when looking for a BPA substitute. You can now ask yourself if there is another way to achieve the function of producing a printed image. This may require a redesign of the thermal paper itself, or you can ask yourself if there is another way to achieve the function of providing a receipt. How about use of electronic receipts or a QR code sent to a person's cell phone? Thinking about the broad function that a chemical of concern provides opens up the door to alternatives far beyond simply using a similar chemical or a drop-in substitute as a replacement. It also opens up discussion of whether the functional performance levels can be adjusted for that specific application. Here are some questions for you and your stakeholders to consider. What is the particular function of the chemical and how is it used in a particular application? So for a specific company, this characterization will be narrow and might be focused on one function and one application. For a government authority or purchaser, such as a hospital, there might be several functions and applications they'd like to consider for a specific chemical of concern. Is the chemical's function necessary for the product or process? Certain functions might not be necessary to achieve product performance, such as antimicrobials and hand soaps or flame retardants in certain types of products. If that function is not required, it might be possible to eliminate the chemical of concern altogether. If the function is necessary, is the current performance level required or might a lower level of performance still be acceptable? Is the chemical of interest intentionally added or is it an unintended byproduct in the formulation? If the chemical is an unintended byproduct or a contaminant, it serves no particular function and the focus of the assessment might involve identifying ways to reduce or remove the contaminant from the formulation or identifying alternative chemicals that would not create specific byproducts or contaminants. Does the replacement of the chemical impact processes up or downstream from the point of use of the chemical of concern? The answer to this question will help you in focusing your efforts on the impacted areas of your process to better assure a successful substitution. Okay, I think we've made that point pretty well, don't you? Moving on from thinking about function, Another key aspect of outlining the characteristics of the chemical of concern is to define the appropriate performance criteria associated with its use. Doing so at this early stage helps identify viable alternatives and collect preliminary information for the performance evaluation and testing that will occur later on in the alternatives assessment process. Performance requirements can also be used to help screen out alternatives that just simply won't be adopted because they can't achieve the required um, technical feasibility and technical needs that your chemical of concern provides. It's important to acknowledge here that defining and evaluating performance is an iterative process. You will need to revisit this um, definition at a later point in your alternatives assessment, and you'll probably want to be looking at it periodically over the course of your whole adoption process. 
Correctly bounding the performance requirements increases the probability that the assessment process will find the most affordable, effective, and innovative solutions. Defining performance criteria too broadly can lead to the selection of alternatives that fail to perform the central function. Simply searching for an alternative solvent, for instance, that has the flammability characteristics your operation and workers are trained to manage may cause you to ignore key variables that might cause you to find the trade-off of a more flammable option more attractive as a solvent for your use. On the other hand, defining performance criteria too narrowly could lead to the rejection of alternatives that have markedly improved human health or environmental performance. An example might be looking for a solvent with a slightly larger molecular diameter than the chemical of concern to help you identify more potentially safer substitutes. When thinking about the bounds on key performance indicators that will help you in identifying potentially viable substitutes for your chemical of concern, carefully consider involving appropriate stakeholders as you do so, the following. Acceptability criteria, either for the processing or the final product quality. Appropriate testing methods and performance standards, such as ASTM standards, and process or use constraints, such as with the flammability example I mentioned earlier. We have one final but very important element to consider when characterizing the chemical of concern during this scoping phase of the assessment, and that is to identify the human health and environmental effects associated with it. This information provides a baseline for comparison with candidate alternatives a process we'll address in later sessions of this training. The step is important during this scoping phase of the, of the assessment as it can help identify human health effects, exposure scenarios and pathways, life cycle segments and environmental impacts of greatest concern for the chemical of concern. This in turn can help to narrow or focus your assessment. For example, exposure to BPA in thermal receipt paper occurs primarily from touching the receipt and then ingesting the BPA when your fingers come in contact with food or your mouth. The focus on alternatives can zero in on this particular exposure pathway as a thing to be avoided. You and your stakeholders can determine how broad or how narrow to define your specific concerns. The more broad, the likely more involved and complicated the assessment will be. The more narrow, the more streamlined the assessment can be, but it can also run the risk of missing potential trade-offs. So it's important to think this through with your stakeholders. The last step in this scoping phase of the assessment is to determine the methods you'll be using to evaluate potential substitutes. If your goal is to identify a substitution that you can confidently implement so as to avoid having to go through the process again in the future, you will want to choose a very rigorous evaluation method with very limited acceptance of data gaps for any candidate alternative. If, however, you are looking to create a new market niche for your product, you may have more flexibility in the choices you make and therefore be less concerned about filling all data gaps. Your methods should be clearly documented and include information on which assessment steps will be conducted, what hazard endpoints will be evaluated, what tools will be used to compare alternatives, and what approach will be used to address uncertainty. Sessions three and four of this training will delve deeper into current methods and tools for the key evaluation steps of the assessment, hazard, exposure, cost, and performance. Elements of the assessment, such as endpoints to examine and assessment steps to include, might need to be modified on the basis of knowledge you gain throughout your process. You want to minimize concerns associated with any biases or predetermined outcomes, so be open to checking back in with yourself. Data gaps and issues of uncertainty are inherent to the alternatives assessment process. 
So it's important to be transparent about how you plan to manage such information or lack of information in the assessment. How such gaps are addressed can depend on the tools you're using to evaluate and compare hazards and other attributes and decision rules you and your stakeholders have established in the scoping process. Data gaps will come up in most sessions, particularly sessions three and four. In session five, we'll go into a bit more detail about strategies for navigating uncertainty and data gaps in the decision-making process. However, I want to stress here an important adage to remember that a lack of evidence of hazard isn't the same as evidence of safety. Here are a few key ideas that I hope you will bring away with you from this session. Scope out your assessment of alternatives thoughtfully. Engage with stakeholders, the right people at the right time. Be transparent about the process that you are using. Carefully consider the function of your chemical and any of its potential substitutes. Recognize that you won't know everything about every aspect of an alternative. So go ahead and acknowledge this and have a strategy for dealing with gaps and uncertainties. See you in session two.